Good morning. Would you please join me as we go before our Father in prayer? Abba Father, we once again gather together as a family to praise and to worship and to honor you for all that you have done. For who you are, that you are Almighty God, that you are our protector, our provider our sustainer in times of turmoil and struggles. We thank you for the gift of Jesus in whom we find life, not just for a moment or even the time that we walk this fallen world's sod, but to those who call him Lord, who serve him faithfully in the good times and in the bad. You've promised life for all eternity. And Father, we long for that day when you call your children home. Yet in the meantime, Father, we desire to be your people. And we desire to serve you as you have called us to serve. And Father, each one of us you call in a slightly different way into a slightly different ministry, but ultimately you call us to the sharing of your gospel, the message of salvation and redemption. And so Father, give us a peace that this world can't understand so that we may be the light to the world you've called us to be. We ask, Father, you would continue to be with the young men and women of our armed forces. Father, we thank you for their commitment to us, a commitment that says they're willing to give and sacrifice their very lives if necessary, that we may gather in this place at this time to worship and honor you. Father, be with those now who are struggling with health issues. Father, we recognize some are in the hospitals, some are in rehab centers, some nursing homes, some hospice. Others are just at home struggling with various health issues. And Father, we thank you for each of those places we named because they are a gift from you. And yet, Father, we recognize that those that you call to serve in those areas can't heal. They can fix, they can replace, but they can't bring healing. That lies in your hands. And so, Father, we pray that you would bring healing to each one but healing, Father, in your way and in your time. Father, we pray for all those others that are struggling with various burdens that they're carrying. Father, would you allow them to know your presence, to know your peace, to know your joy. Father, be with us, those that have gathered here today, for we each carry burdens. Father, help us to lay them down, to give them to you, to share them openly and honestly. Father, just now, would you calm our our spirits? Would you give us attentive hearts that are focused and attuned to you and all that you have to share with us this morning. Set me aside, Father. Come and speak your words of truth and allow your spirit to minister to our spirit in these next few minutes. So, Father, we invite you now 
please come and share with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm guessing that we've all heard the, the saying, the adage, you, you pick the term you want to use. When life gives you lemon, make lemonade. Have you ever wanted to look at somebody and say, I don't like lemonade? Or, I just, I just don't know how I can do that. Because in the midst of those times, when those lemons are coming at us like a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, the only thing we can see is that fastball, and how do I get out of its way before it smacks me square in the face? And oftentimes we can't. And we feel the sting. And we feel the hurt. And we feel the pain. So this morning I want to begin by reminding you that of something we're all painfully aware of. Life is hard. It is. God hasn't promised those who are called according to his purpose, who have called his son Lord and Savior an easy life. In fact, I would argue Scripture tells us exactly the opposite. We need to prepare for a life of struggles and challenges. I also would like to remind you that in the midst of our worst days, when, when those struggles have gotten so heavy and so burdensome that we're not sure we can take the next step, we're not alone. We are never alone if we are His. If we have surrendered to the Lordship of His Son, we are never, ever alone. Unless we just choose to be and say, God, I don't want you here right now. Let me lie in my mire and my muck and my mess and my pain. And God will honor that. It's not what he wants. I think it will break his heart. But he will honor that. I want you to know that God is presence in the many joys of our life. He, he is there and, and he longs to hear us offer our words of gratitude and thanks. And we, we can deal with that. We're pretty good at, at that. But I also want you to know that that same God that's there for your mountaintop experiences is the same God who walks with you in the valley. That same God that wants to hear your praises because of everything that's going right in your life, wants to hear you share with him your deepest hurts, your deepest regrets, your deepest sorrows. He wants to hear about your struggles. And so I want to begin with a verse from, actually two verses from what has become my, my life text, which is found in, in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. It's only part of that text that I refer to, but this one is where it starts. It says, humble yourselves, Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, this is important, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Peter, it seems to me here, is, is sharing two very important truths, truths that we also see as we continue 
our walk and our journey along the, the account of Job's struggles and Job's life. The first is, is simply that God wants us to share our lives with Him. The good, the indifferent, and the bad. Peter says, cast all your anxieties, all of your hurts, all of your deep despairs. Cast them. Give them to the Lord. Sit down and talk with Him. Be real. Be honest. Yes, God already knows, but He longs to hear from you and from me. You see, God doesn't desire for us to carry that weight. His greatest desire is is to lift it. But until we're ready to take what we've grasped a hold of and open our hand and say, God, it's yours. And then don't close it again. Oh, wait, God, you can't have it. I know I said that, but you can't have it. God desires for us to open our hand and give it all to Him. Our anger, our hurt, our despair. Can I tell you, it was 42 years old before I learned that. I was 42 years old. And I didn't learn it from my mom, although I probably should have. I didn't learn it from my dad, although I probably should have. I didn't learn it from my grandpa, who was very dear and important to me. I learned it from a 22-year-old young lady. As I watched my daughter pour out her heart to God, and she was mad. I don't even remember what it was about, but I, I do remember she was mad, and she told God she was mad. And she laid it all bare before God. And I saw a release in her. The burden didn't go away. The struggle didn't go away. But she saw a peace that this world can't understand. How many times have you heard someone instead say, If God were such a a caring and loving God, why would he let this happen to me? Why would he take this loved one away from me because of a heart attack or a stroke or cancer or whatever other terminal illness there may be? Why would he make a loved one of mine have to suffer with dementia and Alzheimer's? And so we complain to God rather than just pour our heart out. And there is a difference between the two. Complaining is just that. It's griping. And we're going to see that's not what we as Christians are called to. But we are called to an act of worship that's called a lament. Sharing our deepest sufferings with the one we love the most, our Savior. But the greater truth, understand that when we pour out our lament, I believe that God will give us a peace in the midst of the storm, but the storm doesn't necessarily pass. And what Peter says is, at the proper time. In other words, not in my time, Because, God, I want you to take it away now. Get rid of it. I don't like it. I don't want it. Take it away. But Peter says, at the proper time. And the only one that knows the proper time is God. He knew the proper time to send his son into this world. At the right time, he sent forth his son into this world, born of a virgin. He knew the proper time for his son to go to the cross. And Jesus would say, my hour has now come. He knows the proper time to remove our pain 
but he will always be there to give us peace and reassurance that we're okay and that he is with us. Few sermons or lessons have been taught on this particular chapter of, of Job, probably because it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to read. Maybe it's because we, we see this as a, a weak moment in Job's life, chapter 3 of, of Job's book. I mean, here's a man whom God himself praised for, for the life he had been living, his conduct, his faith. God says, Satan, consider, consider Job. Look at, look at Job. Job wasn't even on Satan's radar, apparently, until God says, look at him. And then God allows Satan. God steps back. He pulls part of his protection away from Job. But don't miss something. God never left Job. God was well aware. He was there for every step of what Job would go through. But he allowed him to suffer. And we don't always understand that, and we don't always like that. But God will allow us to suffer for, for two primary reasons. Some is to discipline us because we've strayed from the path, and he wants us back on that path. And some is just like Job. Job had not strayed from the path. Not that he hadn't sinned in his life, for surely he had. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Job was, in God's own words, blameless and upright. This wasn't about punishing or disciplining Job. This was about Job growing in his faith and his understanding of who God is. And so we, we struggle because in this particular passage, Job is in great distress and he begins to lament. And, and here's the thing. I don't want to focus on, we're going to look at some of the words because we need to understand lament. But I want to focus on what Job said. I want to understand the passage in the context of Scripture and the call of our God to be real and to be honest and to be authentic with Him, even in our times of worship. We find these words by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Notice how it begins. All. Not one thing. Not, not, not a few things. Not the, the, the things I just want to, but all. Scripture, the wonderful passages that speak of Christ's love and His grace for us and the healings and all of those things, those are wonderful things to study and they're important and they have messages for us. But we need to understand that there are times when Scripture is hard, it hurts, and it's ugly. And it's still something that Paul says is useful to us. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for helping us to grow, to, for correcting, for reproof, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, whole, full, equipped for every good work that God has for him. Oh, and by the way, some of the good work God wants you to do is found in the midst of our mess and in the midst of our struggles and in the midst of our pain. All of Scripture is valuable to us, folks. It helps us in learning who God truly is. And even yet, we know that He doesn't reveal everything there is to know about Him. It's valuable to us in drawing us closer to our Lord and our Savior as we dig into it and as we study it. And I would argue maybe even more so those passages we don't like that are hard, that are in-your-face type passages. 
This morning's text is, is that type of text. It may not be in your face, but it, it's a text we, we don't want to hear because we, we look at Job and we think, Job's this blameless and, and righteous, upright man, and yet he says these type of things? How could someone know God and say these type of things? Oftentimes, these verses are pulled out to deal with in uh, messages on Great Depression, suicide. But what is happening in the midst of all of this, I think we need to understand, is Job is continuing to do what he'd been doing from the moment he got hit by these disasters. Remember what it said? Job worshipped his God. And even in the midst of this, this, this lament that he goes through is an act of worship on Job's part. He's confessing, I don't understand it. And he's saying, maybe life would have been, he, he's having that um, wonderful life syndrome at the moment. Life would have been better without me. The world would have been better off without me. But that wasn't true. And God knew that wasn't true. Much of Job's utterances is, is that, it's that lament for what is going on because he, he doesn't understand it. But nowhere in any of this do you hear him again curse God. Nowhere. It's a cry out to his God to try and help him understand. It's full of questions, why, why God? I don't understand. Much of Job's utterance is is in a totally different direction than we will see those of his friends. You see, Job's not arguing a point. He's trying to understand his experience. He's also trying to retain or, or more accurately recover what he seems to think has happened, that God has left him, that that friendship that he had with God, that relationship he had with God is gone, which is the furthest thing from the truth. And the same is true with us. No matter what our struggle is, it isn't because God has turned his back on us and he hates us. It's not in his nature, first of all. But God loves us, and he desires the best for us. And sometimes, sometimes the best for us, I know the world doesn't agree with this, and I'll tell you in the moments that it was happening to me, I didn't either. But I love this meme I've seen recently. And I forget how it exactly starts, but basically it says, um, What we need more is for God or for Jesus to take off his flip-flop and whack us on the bottom. I didn't like getting whippings. And it didn't always have to take a whipping. Because I will tell you that my father had a way of saying my name. And I was crushed. At that moment, I'll be honest with you, I would have begged him to beat me. Because the disappointment in his voice crushed me. But my dad never stopped loving me just because I had those moments. In fact, that's why he did it is because he loved me so much that he wanted me to become a better man, a better person, a better husband, a better son, a better father, a better grandfather. That's who God is. And he's never left us. He's always been there. Even in those moments when we've chosen to turn our back on him, God hasn't given up his pursuit. So instead, Job appeals to God again and again. His prayers may shock his religious friends, and they do. It's it's what triggers much of what they have to say over the next several chapters.
It may even shock us, and I would venture to say it does, but at least God's, at least in God's silence, Job's not hearing, he's not feeling, he's not seeing, but even in the midst of all that silence, Job doesn't stop talking to his God. He doesn't. It's raw, it's real, and he lays it all out. And God wants to hear it from him. You see, Job's friends, as we'll see over the course of the next couple weeks, talk about God. Job talks to God. And it makes all the difference. And we we can see that at the very beginning of Job 3, uh, starting in verse 1, 1 and 2. After this, that's, after this is that seven days that he'd been sitting there with his friends in total silence. After that, Job opened his mouth. Job is the first one to speak. And notice it doesn't say, and he cursed God. Or even that he cursed God for, or whoever for taking his family. It says he cursed the day of his birth. And Job said... How one understands the significance of of this text, this chapter, in the account of Job, I believe is determined largely on who we see Job speaking to. Is Job just speaking to himself just to let it all out? Or is Job sharing with a father whom he doesn't know whether he's listening or not, but I want him to know. I believe it's the latter. Job is just saying, God, I need you to know what this has done to me. Even though I know you know, I want you to hear it from me. I think it's that important. And I think it's that important, folks, that we learn to do biblical laments and to share our greatest hurts. And even if we're mad at God in the moment, it's okay. God's tough. He can take it. I guarantee you, he can take more than you can put out. And while Job's three friends are are there and listening, these words are not spoken to them either. These are words spoken from a point of deep distress, however. Grief and anguish. Job is laying his life bare before his God. As I've said, nowhere does he curse God or blame God. He's merely sharing with the only one who could even possibly fully understand what it is he's going through. Who could understand and appreciate the, the pain and the deep hurt. And it's at this moment Job cannot think beyond his grief. He can't remember the the good days. He's wrapped up in all that has happened. He can't see past that. And oftentimes, isn't that where we find ourselves? In the midst of the storm, we can't see past the pain. Even Peter was that way. Got out of the boat, took two or three steps maybe, And his focus changed. It went back to the storm. And what happened? He sank. And in a moment of desperation, he cries out to his God, to his Lord, to his Savior. And Jesus reached down and lifts him up. I won't tell you that that in the midst of your pain, when you cry out to God, that he's immediately going to lift you up. He may need you to go through whatever it is you're going through. And we may never be able to make sense of it until we stand before him. We may never get the answers we want. Job wasn't sure he would either. But Job got one answer. By the time this is all over, Job is reminded that his God was with him.
I want you to hear the desperation. The, the, these are words of lament that, that Job is just laying bare. We're not going to read all of them. I'm going to go straight through them. We're going to jump down verse by verse. But this is Job just being real. Job being honest. Job 3, 3-4 three through four says, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. May it be forever wiped from history. Verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why come out from the womb? Why not come out from the room and just expire? So maybe even if I was born, why didn't I just in that moment die? Life would have been better. Verse 16 and 18. Or why was I not hidden, still stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. Wouldn't I have been better off? There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. Master. And then verses 23 through 26, as he closes out his lament. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me. And what I dread befalls me. I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but troubles come. God, this is where I'm at. I need to understand, and I don't. And so it seems to me I would just have been better off to never have been born. And yet the impact Job had on lives of people before this and then after it cannot be counted. It's much like the George Bailey character. The number of lives that man touched that he didn't even know. So we need, folks, to learn to lament again. It was, it was central to the, the worship of, of the children of Israel. Do you realize that 40%, now that's less than 50, I get it, but that's a huge chunk. 40% of the, the, the Psalms, the hymn book that they would use as they went into temple worship were Psalms of lament. They were pouring out their hurt before God through the words of, of these Psalms. Yet in our lives today, we, we, we don't want to be there because we don't want to feel that pain. We'd rather focus on the, the upbeat songs, the, the good songs, the songs that are joy. And maybe sometimes we need to get back to being honest and saying, you know, at times, and, and forgive me, but I'm going to say it as, in a pretty harsh way. And if I offend anybody, I'm apologizing before I say it. Life just sucks. It just does at times. And I think our God wants to know it. He wants to know where we are. Thus, of those of us who have good things we, and are living in relative comfort, safety, protection, provisions, even a life of privilege, we want to sing those triumphant victory songs and praises and celebration. But what happens when when out of left field, tragedy strikes? Where do we go then? Job went to a lament to praise his God. God, this is where I'm at, but I need you to be in charge. A lament, on the other hand, arises out of a community that suffers, that sees the world not as a place where you you flourish, but maybe a place where you barely survive, where you're struggling to just 
make ends meet, where, where you're wondering, where's my next meal coming? And you just have to turn to God and say, I can't do this. But know that he can, and he wants to know that pain. You see, the bigger message is that God wants to be a part of all of you, including the valleys. He wants to hear the cry of his children. And he hears over and over again. We see that throughout scriptures. They were in Egypt, God heard their cries. Every time they were oppressed, God heard their their cries in the book of Judges and sent a judge to deliver them. God hears our cries. He just will respond, not in our time, but in his time, because his time is always right. Laments arise out of our suffering. It's when folks are are struggling with the reality of their lives. They struggle to pay those bills. They they struggle to, to make ends meet. You see, a lament is not simply, as I've said, complaining to God. It is a sharing of where we are. It's a, at the root of a lament, it's just being blatantly honest with God. It's being willing to reveal where your heart is in the moment. It is a sharing with the one who cares and ultimately desires to restore your life of joy. So I want to remind you of something that I think too often we forget. God's word actually encourages us to lament before our God, to share our pain and our suffering, to speak an honest truth, to say, Lord, this is, this is what I'm feeling. I, I need you to know because I don't understand what's going on. But in the midst of that, What we're all also saying is, God, this is where I'm at. And I don't know that I can take the next step. I know I can't do it by myself. So I need you to take it with me. Or help me to take it. Maybe it's that picture of footprints in the sand when there's only one set of footprints. In that moment, God is carrying us. So I remind you where we started. In the book of 1 Peter. Verses, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. God cares for you. He wants you to share everything. And I believe especially He wants you to share when you're struggling and when you're hurting, and when you don't know if you can take the next step. It's a beautiful old hymn. Let me close with with this thought. It was written by Tommy Dorsey, or Thomas Dorsey, in 1932. And the music was done by a man named George Allen. The song's power comes from a profound personal tragedy that that Thomas Dorsey would suffer in 1932. He was at the top of the world. He'd recently been hired as the director of gospel chorus at the Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago, and he was about to become a father for the very first time. As the due date for that child drew near, Thomas Dorsey was nervous about traveling to a a gospel music convention so close to to their due date. But his wife encouraged him, gave her his blessings to go and and be there. And while he was in St. Louis, Dorsey received word that there had been 
complications with his wife Nettie's childbirth. He raced back to Chicago. But by the time he had got there, both mother and child had died. A double funeral took place there at the, the Baptist church. And Doisy later said, I looked down that long aisle to the altar where my wife's casket was with, with the baby laying in that same casket with her. He said, my legs got weak. My knees would not work right. My eyes became blind with a flood of tears. And Dorsey found himself where Job was, in deep despair and depression. He questioned his faith, and he thought about giving up gospel music altogether. Dorsey had a friend, a, a fellow choir director, Theodore Fry, who persuaded him to accept a dinner invitation. After dinner, Dorsey meandered over to a grand piano that was there, and he, he began to play the hymn, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? With this lyrics, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. There's going to be struggles. Dorsey began to play variations of the hymn's melody, adding new lyrics. And out of that came this song. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm worn. Those are words of lament, folks, in the midst of this song that became his prayer. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me, on, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me on. Let's pray. Precious Lord, take our hands. Because, Father, each one of us, whether we are ready to share it openly with others, walked into this place today hurting from something in our lives. Maybe it was a poorly spoken word in the heat of a moment. Maybe it was the diagnosis of, of cancer or leukemia, which is a cancer, I know, but, or ALS, or heart disease, or lung disease, the death of a loved one. Father, we're, we're all carrying them. I don't know what each one is. I know what mine are. So, Father, take our hands. Help us stand. Because we confess there are times when we are so tired and so weary and so worn. And we need you. But more importantly, Father, we need you so that we can show the world that you care, that you love, and that even in the midst of their hurt and their pain and their sin and their muck and their mess, you were there for them. So help us to be people who pour out our hearts, good and bad, 
before you each and every day. Surrendering our lives in full trust and devotion to you. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We come to a time of response. And maybe today, instead of the response being one of stepping out in faith, although that could be what God has laid on your heart today, and we encourage you to take that, maybe today is just a time to reflect on God to be real and honest and lament before him in prayer. If you'd like me to pray with you, please come forward and we will pray. And if I have to stay here for two or three hours to pray with people, I'll do that. Because you are loved by God and by me and by others. And so he is speaking. And I encourage you not to ignore him, but to respond. For those who will see this later today online or later this week, that offer is for you as well. He's speaking to you. And we stand ready here at Monrovia Christian Church to, to serve him by loving and honoring you. So would you give us a call this week? Allow us to share with you the love of Christ and to pray with you in your time of greatest need. Would you stand now with us as we sing?